Hi there, I'm Dr. Jesse Morrison. I'm a sports medicine doctor here at the Osteopathic Center. I want to talk to you about a specific injury that happens to occur more often in runners, particularly females, unfortunately, that starts with this kind of vague groin pain and worsens as the person starts to run more. It can happen in gymnasts, it can happen in ballerinas, but traditionally it happens in runners and long distance runners, whether you're a triathlete, whether you're uh, just running for recreation or you're a marathoner or an ultra marathoner. These are the type of injuries that happen to a tendency to occur in you. So let's talk about stress fractures of the hip. So stress fractures of the hip can happen in a couple different ways. I printed out a little bit of material here. I have an MRI of one that was recently identified uh, at my clinic. And I wanna talk to you about how they happen, how we can potentially prevent them, how we identify them, and then eventually how we treat them. So the issue with the hip is that it takes a lot of stress from uh, running, constant, pounding along with a combination of other factors can lead to some significant issues in the hip. Now, usually this occurs either in your 20s or in your 40s, but it really can happen at any point in time depending on the volume and some underlying conditions along with way too much volume and not enough rest. So the, the, the hip is structured kind of like a ball and socket. We're not talking about the socket here, that's the pelvis we're talking about the ball. So the ball, essentially, if I, if I pull up the piece of paper, you can see here, the ball is shaped like this. Well, unfortunately, this neck has a tendency to get a lot of stress. When there's a lot of stress in that part of the neck, uh, it has a tendency to wear down. The blood supply isn't strong enough to uh, fill up that bone where it keeps having causing these little micro fractures. And as a result, it ends up uh, getting these early cracks in the bone and with repetitive stress will eventually cause a full stress fracture. If that stress fracture is not caught in time or is ignored, that complete bone will completely fracture off. So instead of having this ball on this socket, you're gonna have this ball fracture off. That is surgery until proven otherwise. So you want to prevent it from getting to that point and ideally identifying the early signs to say, what am I missing here? Uh, what's going on? And how do I prevent this from ever happening? Because runners in their nature want to run. That's usually their form of stress relief. That's what they love to do. The problem is if you suffer this hip fracture, you might not run at least for six months, maybe a year, maybe ever again. So that is a detrimental uh, cause uh, or, or, or ruling uh, if someone ends up suffering one of these significant injuries. So you don't want it to happen. You want to prevent it from happening. So that's kind of why I'm recording this today. The, uh, there's two parts of that neck. There's what we call the compression side, which is on the bottom. And then there's the tension side, which is on the top. If you think of that neck as 100%, Anything over 50% of the neck is very, very risky and you probably are gonna need surgery and have a huge screw put in there. If it's under 50% and it's on the bottom part of the neck and you need an MRI to confirm this, you can maybe get lucky and do a combination of a couple different conservative options. Let's talk about some other ways that this traditionally happens before we get to that. So. There's something called the female athlete triad or, or FAT, F-A-T. This is kind of a combination of factors that kind of perfect uh, brews the perfect storm, which eventually leads to a, mul a multitude of different injuries. A stress fracture of, of the leg or of the hip is one of them. Stress fractures in general of the hip are not super common, about 11% of all stress fractures. So they're not super common, but in the right population, female runners traditionally have a lot higher. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen really in men that much because of the way that their bones are structured. Um, amenorrhea or lack of menses, lack of a period, whether due to low weight or, 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 or hormonal abnormalities, 
is a big cause or a big, a big sign of the female athlete triad. You can also have issues with eating, whether you're eating too much and then maybe you're vomiting, or maybe you're not eating enough. And a lot of people think that they're getting enough calories, but in actuality with what they're burning and what their normal basal metabolic rate is, they're burning way too many calories and their body just doesn't have the energy to replenish and re-strengthen that bone uh, that, that you're complete, uh, you know, damaging every day, every day, every day. So the last part is something that, uh, may go unnoticed until you're in your thirties, maybe your forties, uh, sometimes even in your fifties or, or really when it's too late. So osteopenia or osteoporosis is weakening or weakness of the bone, depending on what grade it is. This can be, uh, does get impacted by genetics. A lot of it gets impacted by your diet. Uh, veganism, unfortunately, has a, a traditionally lower calcium intake, which has higher risk for osteopenia and osteoporosis. If you have someone in their 30s or 40s who suffers a stress fracture, a significant stress fracture in their hip, there's a good chance they already have osteopenia or osteoporosis, and they may not have known it. So there are a, a couple different uh, ways we need to evaluate this. This usually starts as this throbbing, aching pain in the hip, in the groin area, usually the front of the groin, that gets a little bit better with, with resting. But once you start running again, you feel it's starting to bother you again. And you're like, all right, something's wrong. The issue with these is they usually don't show up on x-ray unless it's really bad. So if you see it on x-ray, that's bad. If you don't see it on x-ray, don't think you're out of the woods yet. That usually means you need an MRI. CAT scans are only helpful in certain situations and usually after a, a fracture is already diagnosed for surgical purposes. And you have, it has radiation, so it's a lot easier to get an MRI and they're a lot better for this diagnosis. There are a couple different ways that uh, doctors like myself can diagnose this or you can even diagnose this on yourself. So if you are hopping on one leg, on the bad leg, and it really hurts, that's called the hop test. There's a good chance you have a stress fracture. You can also put your hand underneath your thigh, like on a flat surface where you have hand uh, flat surface and then the thigh is on top of it. And then you push down on the end of your thigh and you end up causing uh, a pain in that hip. There's a chance that you may have a stress fracture. That's what we call the fulcrum test. Now, uh, the best test that you're gonna see is what we call an MRI. So you, might as well get it with contrast, unless you're allergic to contrast, but this is what a normal hip on an MRI should look like. Okay, you can see the contrast in the bladder, that's that white. This is what it normally should look like. This is the ball in the socket, this is the neck, and this is a normal hip, so to speak. Now, let's look at the other person's hip, the other's hip. You see this huge white area right there? That's not supposed to be there. You see that huge white dividing line? That's a stress fracture of the hip. That is a very big deal. If the person keeps running on this, and this was a 40, mid 40s female with hip pain, if you see this, this is a what we call a compression stress fracture. If they keep running on that, they are going to completely fracture that neck off the top. And as a result, they have no choice but to at least get a screw, huge screw, placed through here and down into the shaft. If that is not sufficient, they need to replace the whole hip. Yeah. The other thing that can happen is this has to be monitored to make sure that it gets blood supply back after the screw. That's what we call AV AVN or avascular necrosis. If this screw is put in there after the surgery, then the blood supply does not come back and fill in the area around the screw to stabilize it, then you have to basically do it all over again and maybe replace the hip in totality. So this can be a very bad injury, okay? This, if you happen to catch this, this is like holding the straw and here's the camel's back and it's slowly coming down. If you can catch it and stop it, you may stop this really, really bad cascade of injuries. 
So that's Im how important this is. I cannot stress enough exactly what is going on here. Okay, so what are some of the uh, potential treatments for this? First off, you have to become non-weight bearing. You have to go into crutches or a, 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 wielder, a wheeler or a, a, a walker, something along those lines, something that has to uh, be in a wheelchair that you have to remove the stress from this hip. You cannot continue to put weight on this hip, even though it's just regular walking, that is a very, very big deal. Any additional stress is gonna cause that neck to fracture. And again, that's, that's all she wrote after that. That's really bad. So the other thing is that this is gonna take at least a month, sometimes two months, okay? That's a long time. What are you gonna do in the meantime for exercise. Well, first off, I'd probably have you shut it down completely for two weeks, maybe four. There's a couple things that this, there's a good article uh, in, the, in, in the journal that discusses uh, this, and I'm, I'm gonna review a couple things and show you them. So um, what are some other treatment options or, or, or you know, uh, other options that uh, are going to, uh, you, you can change to, to potentially uh, help with your, uh, stress, but not running. So you can swim, you can bike, but I would probably do stationary bike or very low grade, no crazy inclines. And you'd also, uh, you can do running in water, but I probably wouldn't do it for the first month, maybe even a little bit longer than that. And again, this depends on the severity of the fracture. The other thing that needs to go, uh, you can do upper body weights, that's fine, but squatting is out of the question. Any lower body stuff is not a good idea because you're gonna add stress to that joint. Okay, let's talk about a couple other things and then I'm gonna tell you about some labs that you should probably check. So um, the there are a couple different factors that play a role in this. There's what we call intrinsic factors, means things that inside of you that you really can't control. And then there's extrinsic factors, things that you can control. The intrinsic female is very high risk. Uh, amenorrhea, as we said, lower bone density, like, like osteopenia, osteoporosis, and inadequate muscle function. Being your muscles are weaker, you do not have mus muscle mass. And then there's biomechanical features. So poor running form, maybe your gait is off, maybe you are landing on the wrong side of your foot or your, or, or your um, cadence is a little off. So any of these can directly affect the, and, and add additional stress to that hip. Some intrinsic factors include overtraining, you know, when you should really be only running 15 miles a week and you're running 30, obviously your hip's not gonna be able to have time to heal as, as fast as you're asking it to. Inadequate equipment, maybe you're not changing your shoes as the required four to 500 miles, every, you know. Um, energetic, so if you're not appropriately supplementing your body with the appropriate nutrition. Nutrition is key, especially for distance runners, especially for triathletes. Without poor, with poor nutrition, you're going to not only suffer in performance wise, but you're likely gonna have a lot higher risk for injuries because you're not appropriately uh, providing those muscles with the nutrition that they need to heal themselves as fast as you're banging them up. Okay, so the last couple of things that I can talk to you about um, really have to do with um, things that you can also address to prevent. There has been a couple fascinating studies that have identified shifting uh, of certain muscle groups. And when they get weak, they have a tendency to put more stress on the neck of the, of the femur, of the, of the hip. And at that point, that can lead to significant stress. So if you have uh, weakening of the gluteus medius or the gluteus minimus, so the maximus is, is the buttocks, the two muscles underneath them, which attach on the side of the hip, and kind of start at the beginning in the middle of the back, uh, one on each side. If those are weak, you're going to have shifting of those uh, of the stress, and you're going to add more stress. So you you have to do your hip flexor exercises. Uh, if you're ever in a gym and you see that 
uh, that machine that you put your legs in and you push a, a gout a, a against it out or vice versa if you push inward that is what this is specifically used for the other thing that you can do is some of those uh, some gyms or exercises you can put a bar across your waist and, and kind of lay down and you're doing like hip extensions this is very good for this as well um, last couple thoughts uh, overall nutrition is key but we need to make sure there are no underlying lab abnormalities that may be contributing to this. So uh, let, I have a list here. I'm, I'm just looking for it. Here it is. Okay. So here's things that you should potentially uh, want to, uh, and I'll put this in, in, in the notes below, uh, want to check if you are concerned about this to make sure that you don't have any underlying conditions. Uh, vitamin D is vital. I know 30 is supposed to be normal. No, no, no. I want it closer to 80, okay? 80 is where you really want to be, at least above 50. Calcium, very important. If your calcium is low, especially if your dietary supplemental calcium is low, you need to bump that up immediately. I put this on all my patients who have stress fractures. Phosphorus, alkaline phosphatase, serum uh, protein electrophoresis. You need to do a couple different crazy tests. Uh, parathyroid hormone. Uh, CEA, uh, there's a couple more, CA125, CEA919, your doctors will know what these are, you may not, um, CEA153, and AFP, and then you're going to do a urine calcium level. So uh, all of these can check to see if there's something else going on. Maybe you have hypoparathyroidism. Maybe you actually have an underlying arrhythmia that you're not aware of because uh, of your parathyroid level, which is indirectly eating your bone, causing you to have a stress fracture. So you may end up catching other stuff that you don't know about. So sometimes this may be uh, a warning sign that you're not aware of and you need to take this very seriously. So if you like the video, hit the thumbs up, uh, hit the subscribe to the channel. And if you have any questions, we would happily be able to consult with you. Even if it is a phone consult, we do those all the time. Thank you for tuning in. Take care.